Uh, at a much lower level of carbon emissions say that, no, you're going to have to start just in the 1990 levels and not worry about the fact that we've had all the benefits of spewing carbon for hundreds of years. So that's one, I think, a major issue. The other thing, I was actually just reading in the paper this morning about this, was about um, how, in, in, in terms of diversity, how important it is to have everyone come to the table, everyone be involved in the decision-making process. And, and those of you that have been involved with Copenhagen or keeping up on what's going on, you know, the United States and other countries are, are really trying to negotiate something on their own and then present it to the rest of the negotiators. And if this goes through, if we are successful in this route, I think you know, we can make some progress, but in terms of the long-term success of reducing climate emissions, I think it's gonna be a real fatal error. And we've learned over and over again, if you want to help, what we learned in terms of going to uh, work in food communities, you have to have people be involved in part of the process. You just can't say, this is gonna be good for you, you'll go forward with this. And I feel like that's really what we're doing with things like the carbon credit system. We're saying, this is going to be good for you. You're going to get carbon credits. You can sell them on the global markets. And I, I think people are rightfully saying, you know, let us be involved in the process. Let us decide what is best for us. And so unless we go forward with that, I think we're going to continue to have some of these climate justice issues that could derail Copenhagen either now or years into the future. Thank you, Mark. So Marion, uh, nutrition advice can sometimes seem so complicated. And now we're hearing advice about, well, then how do we eat a low carbon diet? And, and for some people, it could seem like conflicting messages, or it could seem like we're really kind of complicating the message, or it's too confusing to understand. And uh, I, I'm wondering if you can, in, in, your, in your beautiful and eloquent way, <laughs> uh, help, us, uh, help us tie these connections. What are we really talking about? That how does the, your nutrition advice maybe connect with the advice we're talking about in terms of climate-friendly food? Yeah, well, they're totally connected. I mean, I'm always amazed when people say, Oh, nutritionist, your advice changes all the time. When in fact it hasn't changed in the 30 years since I've been teaching about nutrition, and if you go back and do the history, it hasn't changed for 50 years since chronic diseases replaced deficiency diseases as the main nutritional problems in the United States. Um, and the advice is very simple. I mean, my sort of hand way of doing it is eat less, move more, eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and don't eat too much junk food. Food. If you do that, you're doing climate change at the same time. And that advice, just eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, and grains, don't eat too much food, and go easy on the junk food, takes care of all of the chronic diseases. It takes care of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, the whole works. It also takes care of climate change. So the same dietary advice that's appropriate for health of people is appropriate for health of the planet. It's really simple, it's just that more people need to do it. <laughs> so Karen, if, if, if everything that Marion said is, is so true and, and the principles of, of, of healthy eating and climate friendly eating are, are so knitted together, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, we also, we often hear people dismiss us advocates of local healthy food as kind of pie in the sky dreamers. You know, we, we uh, that, that, we're told that people, especially young people, that they're choosing fast food and happy meals and, and, and you know, just look at the lines of the drive-through at the, at the fast food joints and, and that kids are kind of naturally um, opposed to broccoli. And I'm wondering what your take is from your perspective and do we first have to transform tastes before we can transform policies? I think um, I'm gonna just sort of piggyback on what uh, Mark said. I think we need to really understand our history if you look at uh, people in low-income neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color, the youth, I mean, our history is agriculture. Our background is agriculture. And there needs to be a, a link and co a correlation to that. I think what you're finding in a lot of um, uh, neighborhoods is that people are now losing that history. So a child that goes to school eating junk food doesn't understand exactly the connection of where that food comes from. Something is lost in the translation. And I think it's lost in the fact that we're not having that conversation at the table. We're not sitting down with the elders and the youth and having that conversation like, you know what? 20, 30 years, I used to go in my backyard and get vegetables, or I grew up on a farm and this is how things taste. And we're not having that conversation. And what you're finding in neighborhoods in, in terms of substituting that is that you're finding fast food restaurants one after another. You can go in my neighborhood and you can count on your hand how many hospitals, one hospital, compared to the hundreds of fast food restaurants. 
How about health food stores? How about food corps? You don't see that. But yet, you know, it's interesting. When you look at the colors of fruits and vegetables, the same colors are in our junk food. Mm -hmm. So kids, <laughs> normally, when you think about, I mean, that's, that's a marketing right. ploy that that's people right. do. <laughs> they use the colors of food and vegetables to get kids to eat what they think is healthy. Another example, I had a kid one time, I said, so you're eating um, a strawberry shortcake. Look at the ingredients and tell me where in that ingredients it says strawberry. <laughs> or, or you drink a grape soda or an orange soda. Where in the ingredients does it say orange or grape? So there needs to be had, needs for that conversation to start at the beginning so people understand where our history is in food and be inclusive in the conversation. Not only talking amongst ourselves, but let's talk to our children and integrate them in the conversation. Mm. Can I say yes, yeah, yeah. something about that too? What I heard in your question also was the, the elitist charge, mm. that what we're talking about here today is elitist. And I hear it so often that I think it's something that everybody who's doing activism around food systems and climate change really has to take on in a very serious way. And it's kind of what Vandana Shiva was talking about, where she's teaching farmers to have very, very small plots in which they grow nine different crops. That's the Navdanya center that she's doing. And they can feed their families off of that and have enough, enough left over to send their kids to school, which is what her goal is. And that, it seems to me, is not elitist. That's helping people feed themselves. And if we're going to feed the world, we have to feed ourselves first. Um, and you know, I've, I'm interested in hearing people's ways of dealing with the elitism charge because it does come up. It's just like personal responsibility on dietary advice. Why don't parents, kids aren't eating well, it's the parents' fault, mm -hmm. right? It's not the system's fault. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with these kinds of issues in teaching people, I think is a really important question. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think all of the, the, the points you all have made all really call us to have a conversation about if we're going to talk about food systems, I think we can't talk about shifting the food system without talking about power, mm -hmm. uh, without talking about who has it, who doesn't. And so I'd like any of you to, to jump in here, but I'm just curious from each of your vantage points, where do you see power lying? And where do you see the leverage points for flexing our, our power? Any, any uh, yeah, I would like to say the power's in the people. <laughs> the, 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 pow the power is in our hands, okay? You know, People talk about politics and politicians, but you, you elect these people, okay? They work for you, all right? We need to take back our communities and really be strong in the fact that our voices have to be heard. We cannot have outside people dictating the way we live, the way we grow our food, the way we eat. The power is in our hand, and it's a shared power. It's not an individual power. It's a shared power to get things done. And when we start getting people to think that way and look at us and take us seriously, the power is in our hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I will, uh... I'll send my greetings from the land of Cargill in Minnesota. <laughs> and I thought, Madonna Shiva just said this so well that they're gonna do everything possible for us not to recognize the power that we have. And I'll mention, like, when we try to address climate and we're trying to address water issues, Monsanto will have a seed for that. And Cargo will have some sort of hybrid vehicle way of transporting that new grain somewhere else. They'll find a way to say, if you wanna have reduced carbon emissions, we'll get you carbon emissions. But I think you really pegged it on that it's much more than reducing carbon in our system. What we wanna do is retain the power. And I really feel like what you all are doing on the local level and what we, the same thing happening in Minneapolis, the community gardens, the CSAs, uh, there's the, the huge energy behind local foods. This is kind of recognition. It goes beyond food miles. It goes beyond organics and sustainable. I think it really feels like, you know, we're recapturing the sacredness of food. Mm. And that w this is a sacred food system that we're recreating that has been stripped away by, uh, largely by agribusness. And so we're taking it back. And thanks to the power of Karen and the mm -hmm. rest of us. Mm -hmm. The, the elitism argument and the personal responsibility arguments are about power. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. It's, it comes out of fear that the power is being returned to the people, and the corporations don't like that. Mm. Eating less is very bad for business. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
following up on that, Marion, let me ask you, the last time I was in this room, I was here at an Advertising Age conference. I don't know if any of you read Advertising Age, uh, but it's the <laughs> Advertising Industry Magazine. It's actually fascinating, fascinating reading, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'm revealing the extent to which I'm a complete dork, but yes, fascinating <laughs> reading. But anyway, I was, I I was here at an Advertising Age conference, and it was a conference on green marketing, and particularly from the food industry. And so on the stage, there was somebody from McDonald's talking about how they were launching a, a green Happy Meal, and how this Happy Meal was going to uh, encourage, this was in Europe, encourage young people to think about the environment. So I'm curious, Marion, from your perspective, you know, what role do you think food companies can play in this movement? Is there a role for the green Happy Happy Meal. Uh, uh, what, what would you say to that? <laughs> I did a blog post this week on uh, the great big full page ad in the New York Times from General Mills where they're reducing the amount of sugar in their kids' cereal by one gram. <laughs> um, and I don't know how much you pay for full page ads in the New York Times. It must be eighty or a hundred thousand dollars or something like that. But they must feel like it's worth it. And the wonderful thing about it was that they made a pledge that they were going to do this, but they didn't say by when. <laughs> Oh, but this is exactly the same thing as the greenwashing that all of these companies are doing. And I was just astounded to read in the New York Times op-ed last weekend that Jared Diamond had a... Jared Diamond, whose book uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel I greatly admire um, as a... Uh, as an explanation of why food systems depend so much on geography. Uh, but he has apparently drunk the Kool-Aid. And he had, a, um, he had an op-ed on how he used to think that corporations were greedy and evil and only interested in short-term profits, but now he realizes that they're interested in long-term sustainability. And the three corporations he singled out for praise were Chevron, Walmart, and Coca-Cola. I was astounded. Uh, so they're doing wonderful things with one hand, but then on the other hand, um, they have to do short-term profits. It's the nature of corporations. It's their job to do short-term profits. And it's our job to put restrictions on those short-term profits so that they're not being greedy. I might have heard that same McDonald's person on a couple years ago, because it's, it's stuck with me ever since is that he said, are we talking about healthy or healthier? We're not sure that McDonald's can make you healthy, but we'll make our product healthier. And so just as you're saying, Mary, it's, it's like going from here to here. And what we're talking about for health, what we're talking about for community food systems, what we're talking about for climate change, we need to go from here to here. And I just don't think if we continue with this agribusiness paradigm, if you know, this, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to add to it, because I got your Happy Meal. McDonald's, Happy Green Meal, how about going into a community garden and pulling out some carrots and papalo and papiche and tomatillas? That's the Happy Meal. <laughs> <laughs> the McDonald's I'm talking about. But I think um, as consumers, we have the power, we have a voice that we can go and sort of change the dynamics in, 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 in what's happening in our, in our supermarkets, in, in our, our bodegas. And I'm not putting a blame game, but what I can say is that the power of our dollars, the power of a benefit card to go into and say, you know what, if you don't change, we're not going to shop here. And so we do have that power. We're not powerless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have another question, and I guess this is kind of for, for any of you who want to take this on. I'm curious to, to hear what you all think about what difference we can make by working on a local level versus national or international. I mean, if we're talking about the climate crisis, it's really a, a, a global crisis, hunger global crisis. Uh, what does working locally achieve, and, and can we really be tackling these crises locally? Again, this is for, for, for any of you. Um, how, how would you respond to that? Yeah. Well, to my community gardens out there, that uh, 700 of us who have been out there for over 20 years, uh, just taking that on, just uh, growing vegetables, healing the soil, using rainwater uh, catchments to help uh, uh, water our systems, um, using composting 
to, to revitalize the soil, um, using the sweat equity that we have in, in giving back and healing. And I think that um, as community gardeners and urban farmers, and even people who have front yards and backyards, and people that are growing things on a windowsill, um, definitely are making a, a difference in this area. Do you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I, I, one thing is I, uh, I've been, I was at ITP since about 1997, and I've been working you know, through two farm bills, the 2002 farm bill, then some of the 2008 farm bill. And about, in 2008, I actually left ITP, and my family and I went down to Honduras for several months, and just, I really was burnt out. And I really had the feeling like, what are we doing? We just, we keep on trying to push this boulder up the hill, and we're not making progress, and you know, I gotta do something else. Once Honduras then came back here, and I just feel like in the course of the two years, there's, there's such enthusiasm, there's just a magic that's, that's happening. And for me, I think what you all have demonstrated working on these local food systems, you presented a different paradigm. And, and so we don't have to follow the same paradigm of corn and soybean production. We can do something else. There are other opportunities. And so well beyond just the, the reduction in carbon emissions and the local food systems that you're providing, we are also providing a new model, as, as uh, the Bureau President was saying, a new model for what we can do uh, throughout the world. Can, can yeah. I just say, uh, you know, I'm at NYU, which is the most urban campus in the world. You know, we, everything is vertical here. And yet our sustainability people have started doing the most amazing things. Last summer, we had vegetables growing in street planters. There's no, you know, there's no uh, land around here, really. Um, and yet, this, these, these innovative people here were trying to do this. I can't think of anything more important than doing it locally. It's one of the reasons why I'm completely charmed by this truck farm movie that Ian <laughs> Cheney and Kurt Ellis, the guys who made King Corn, are doing, because uh, tr by truck farm, they're taking it literally. They're growing food on the back of a pickup truck <laughs> in Red Hook in Brooklyn. Um, I think you can grow food everywhere, and the, just by example, showing how easy it is to grow vegetables, sets, sends a message and a leadership message on this, that this is something that anybody can do. It's fun, it tastes good, and nothing tastes as good as food you've grown yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna wrap up with, with a final question, and, and each of you, uh, I wanna hear from each of you, and you can jump in any, any time. As we sit here today, and as we go out uh, and experience the incredible, I don't know how you, I, don't, I haven't chosen yet where I'm going, I don't know how we all chose where we're going. There are so many amazing panels and workshops happening today. Uh, but as we go out and, and, and have the conversations we're going to have and really get, uh, uh, get into the, the hard work of talking about policy, and as we think about the 15,000 delegates and the many, many thousands more people in Copenhagen that are talking about uh, the, the, the imminent climate crisis that we're faced with. I'm wondering, kind of, on the one hand, it feels so energizing and, and, and exciting to be here. On the other hand, the daunting, uh, facing uh, climate change feels so daunting. So I'm wondering how each of you are experiencing this moment in time. Are you feeling optimistic or are you feeling pessimistic? Are you feeling uh, hopeful or are you feeling despondent? You know, how are you experiencing this, this moment uh, right now? And, uh, uh, any of you can, can start? Maybe we'll start with, uh, want to start, Mary, and we'll go down the line. Sure, I'm teaching food sociology this semester and we're discussing whether food is a social movement. I think food is a social movement. I really do. Not only that, I think it's huge. Why isn't this the most exciting time in the world? It's the most exciting time in the world. I grew up in, I grew up in the, you know, I sort of came of age in the 1960s when we had the free speech movement at Berkeley when I was there and the civil rights movement had just started and it was clear we were gonna win. We were gonna win something. We might not win it all, but we were gonna win something. And we had the experience of winning. I don't think this generation of people has had the experience of winning, but we're gonna win this one. Uh, I, I, I gotta run back to my college days and think of the song, Right Here, Right Now is the place I wanna be. And to answer your question, yes, I, I am more excited now than I've been um, in 20 years about what the opportunities are. I, I just mentioned one thing, um, well two things. One, we have a bunch of uh, materials at IETP on Copenhagen and what we recommend for Copenhagen. 
I don't think I brought enough for everyone. Uh, but it's at IATP.org if you're interested in that. Uh, www.iatp.org. I'm sorry, I just have like six of them here, so <laughs> the first that run here. <laughs> the other thing I just want to say why I'm also excited is there's a great report that almost no one's heard of, and this is called Agriculture at the Crossroads, and it's done by the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development, um, IAASTD. I think it's very unfortunate that... Uh, I'm in history, but the best report in history is yes. fantastic. It, it, what this is, this gives us the... It, there's 400 authors of this, scientists from around the world, and this gives us the, the intellectual powerhouse to go against when Monsanto and Cargill tell us that we have to triple yields by 2050 and have a next green revolution. This is saying that there's much more beyond increasing yields. You know, we have to look at income. We have to look at accessibility. These are the real things that are causing hunger in our world. Uh, and, and so take a look at this report, IAASTD. A very unfortunate, uh, I don't think you should have a STD in any sort of a report. But. Thank you, Mark. Karen. And so how am I feeling? Uh, I think I'm like in the middle of the fence. Um, optimistic that we are having this conversation. Optimistic that hopefully the conversation continues somewhat um, wavering in pessimism only because that we've had this conversation before, it needs to go further, it needs, we need to take this information and make sure it's brought out, especially those who don't have a voice, those who feel disenfranchised, those who are not here, and so that I will feel comfortable and excited when there's food justice for all. Mm -hmm. And that we're taking not only the local level, lo local level here, but it's being transformed from New York City to other states, regionally, and then globally. Then I can shout to the rooftops <laughs> that food justice across the board um, has been achieved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and and I just, I just want to thank all of you so much for, for this panel. This is such a, a fun conversation, such a wonderful way to start the day. Can we all thank our panel for being here? And, and have a, a fabulous day. We are going, we're going to hear from Scott Stringer. Yes, he's yes. here. Have a, a fabulous day. It's been really a, an honor to be here, and it's so, so exciting. Uh, and. Let's hear what Scott's A bigger round of applause for these more. folks, aren't they great? Really great, thank you. Okay, now, now we get to work. It's time to move on to the breakout center, so I have a couple of announcements. The first is the breakout sessions are gonna, conc uh, are gonna start, start moving to where you have to go after I'm done. Um, I wanna just say that there's a Kimmel Center map on page three of your program, so you can find the 29 breakout uh, sessions. Uh, after the morning sessions, we're gonna stop for lunch. A directory of nearby sustainable and veggie-friendly eateries is included in your program. Uh, if you prepaid for the lunch, you can pick it up on the third floor of the Kimmel Center. Also, remember, we have a second round of breakout sessions from 2.30 to 3.30, as well as our closing es expo and a reception from 3.30 to 5, which will be hosted by Chef Mario Batali. And and Professor Marion Nessel. Uh, if, you, if you have time during the day, please feel free to visit the many informational tables stationed throughout the Kimmel Center so you can also do your share of networking. And most importantly, and I already know many of you are doing this in the room, we have a special Twitter room located in room 910, but I know many of you have already started Twittering, so the world is knowing what's going on in this room. Thank you all for coming. Now, here we go, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>